Okay, so here's the third lesson in our uh, unit on collecting and presenting data. And really today we're going to focus on the collecting part of this unit. Um, we've looked at presenting data already in, in lessons one and two, but today we want to talk about collecting data. So how do you obtain data? And um, we've been introduced to the graphical tools that are going to help us summarize it, but we're going to take a step back today. So Statistics Canada is, um, is a government organization. It's a, it's a body within the government of Canada that res that's responsible for the collection of data. And so every few years, um, every five years to be exact, they send out the Canadian census. And a census gathers information about the entire population of the country. It's a legal responsibility that we have to fill out the census. We have to do it. There's no choice. Um, if you, if you, you know that the census is coming, you got to fill one out. However, although the census is a really, really good way of acquiring data, you know, how many millions of people live in Canada? Are we up to 33 million or something like that? Anyways, yeah. the reality is, is that polling all of those families and all of those people, it's very costly and it's very time consuming. And of course... There's still debate in politics right now about whether or not we should go back to a long-form census or we should just do the short... Because the thing is, we need to get information. So, we need to ask ourselves, okay, is there a way that we can get accurate results about a population without having to conduct a census? And a survey is one good way to do that, but it has to be well-designed, and we have to recognize that because a survey is just choosing a sample that the best it can do is estimate mm -hmm. the attributes of the population. And often an estimate is all we're really after. So the cost and time required to do a census is not always necessary if you really just want an estimation of how the population is feeling or behaving or performing on a certain uh, factor. So let's look at some terminology that's associated with um, samples and, and what we're doing here. So if we break down, if we do want to do a survey, then we want to collect a sample, but we need to think about three things. The first thing we want to consider is the population. So are we looking to extrapolate to uh, the whole entire population of Canada or just the population of our school? And so whatever the number of individuals that belong to the group that you're studying, if you want to say students at KCI feel this way, then your population is the students at KCI. Yeah. If you want to say students in Ontario feel this way, then your population is all the students in Ontario. So you first have to think about what kind of conclusions do you want to be able to estimate, and that, that would be your population. Now, you, if, unless you have lots of money and lots of time and you want it to be precise, then you probably want to take a sample or do a survey rather than a census. So that means that the next decision you have to make is, who are the people that you might actually consider asking these questions of. Mm -hmm. So that's your sampling frame. These are the members of your population. So it does have to be the students in Ontario or the students in KCI. But these are the members that actually have a chance of being selected. So maybe you don't have access to all the students in Ontario. Maybe you don't even have access to all the students at KCI, even though you're here. Um, but this sampling frame, these are the people that you could get access to that actually have a chance of being selected for your sample. And again, the sampling frame might be too big. So what's an example of that sampling frame? Like, if we're talking about the students at our school, the sampling frame then would basically be the students who aren't skipping. That day. That day. So it would be the people that are coming to school, because th those are the only members of that population that actually have a chance of being selected. Selected on that day. Because if you don't attend school, then you're not going to have a chance of being selected for our sample. And so once you've chosen your sampling frame, and you might even narrow it down, you might even say my sampling frame will be the people who are in their M6 during block C mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that have a chance of getting your survey that actually handed to them. But then the sample itself are the people that you actually go to and hand the survey to and fill it out. So those, those particular people, those small numbers of people, that's your sample. And your hope is that the sample that you chose when you perform your analysis that that will be a good estimate of your population. You can pick bad samples, and this is what this lesson is going to be a little bit about, helping mm -hmm. you choose good samples. All right, so let's take a look at an example just to make sure that we've got these um, concepts solidified. So for your data management culminating activity, you wish to look at the effect that having a part-time job has on Ontario 12th graders' school grades. 
your principal will not let you survey students outside of your school. All right, so that's a rule that is going to affect some of these um, definitions. Your print credit, so your, so your printing account at school is almost empty, so we can only print out 30 surveys. So what is, so we definitely can't do a census. So what's the population, what's the sampling frame, and what's the sample for this little project? So the first thing that we'll look at is, okay, uh, it's, it's clearly obvious. We'd like to look at the effect that having a part-time job has on Ontario 12th graders' school grades. So if you're looking at 12th grade students in Ontario, um, that's a pretty large group. That's who we're trying to generalize the results of this study towards. So that's going to be our population. If we're looking at what effect does this have on this, well, then the 12th graders in Ontario, that's who we'd like to generalize to. We already know that we obviously can't ask 12th graders outside of our school. So we can't do a census, we can't ask all, and we don't have enough print credits to do that anyways. So now we should say, all right, well, what's the sampling frame? And if we look at this, we can say, okay, well, who has a chance of being selected? Do grade 11 students have a chance at being selected for this? No. No. Do students, um, say, at a different high school have a chance of being selected for this? Nope. So the sampling frame, the only people of this population that actually have a chance at being selected are the 12th graders at KCI, which is our school. And if you're not at our school, you can insert the name of your school there. <laughs> but it would be 12th graders at our school, right? That They're the only ones that have a chance. The sample then becomes the 30 surveys the, the 30 surveyed students that basically we had enough print credits for. Yep. So we printed out our survey. We handed it out in a smart way to 30 people, and we asked them to fill it out. And so basically, that's the population, the sampling frame, and the sample. And if you can get that, um, you know, that's basically how to, to set up all of these problems. Because what we're going to talk about next is we're going to talk about how to select a, sa a good sample and good how to sample. make the most of these 30 printouts. Because if we only have 30 printouts, there are examples of ways that we could select a bad sample, and there are ways that we can select a good sample. So let's look at some of those sampling <coughs> techniques or sampling protocols there have. Uh, they, they're also called. Once you've identified the population, and then you need to decide how are you going to get that sample. So you know the population, you know your sampling frame, you need to figure out who to hand those 30 sheets of paper to for your survey. Uh, so you, you got to decide on the right sampling technique. If, the, if you select the right sampling technique, then even a really small sample can give pretty good extrapolation to the whole population. So we're going to look at simple random sampling, cluster sampling, convenient, stratified, and systematic sampling. We'll also ask you to take a look at multi-stage sampling and voluntary response sampling, and that's in the textbook reading. Yeah, all this stuff is in your textbook. We're going to run through the first example with you here in this lesson. And then what we're going to ask you to do is from here, investigate the others on your own and come prepared to use those in class tomorrow when we, when we do an activity with different types of sampling. Exactly. So here's simple random sampling. Simple random sampling falls into the category of probability sampling because it's based on the fact that every member in the population has an equal chance of being selected. So whenever we decide on what our population is, everyone there has an equal chance of being selected. And so the selection of any one individual does not affect the chances of another one from being chosen. So what that means is, is that they're all independent. So what we do in this case, the best way to describe a simple random sample is that if the population was, say, the population of your school and you wanted to find out perhaps the, the student um, feelings about a dress code, you would, and, and you wanted to perform a simple random sample because you don't want to ask the whole school, it's too time consuming, you would put 
the names or the student numbers or whatever of every single student in the school into a hat and you would draw at random, you know, 40 students or 30 students, however you wanted in the sample. That is a true, simple, random sample. It's based on the fact that every member has an equal pop, uh, chance of being selected. We sh I should note that when you do a simple random sample and you draw out someone's name, you must then replace that name back into the pool so that it doesn't affect the results of other people. So with simple random sampling, it really is that basic probability. Um, here's a couple good examples. Drawing names out randomly, which we talked about, assigning each member a number, and then using a random number generator, say in Excel or something like that. Here's an example. So let's say <clears throat> a data management student is interested in studying the proportion of students in this class that take public transportation to get to school. Since the student is very busy, doesn't want to ask everybody, the student's going to conduct a survey only with those students who roll one of three numbers on their die. So there's an infinite number of possibilities. We could say one, two, three. Yep. We could say four, five, six. Let's do prime numbers. We could say prime numbers, two, okay. three, or five. So let's say if you, if you walk in and you roll two, three, or five on the die that we hand you, that you will be the per one of the people that we ask. And okay. if you roll, conversely, a 1, a 4, or a 6, you are not included in the sample. That's right. So you may be part of the sampling frame that day, but you are not the sample. Mm -hmm. So the question is, did that student use simple random sampling? And we can say yes, because the probability of rolling those three numbers is all equal. Every die, if it's balanced and fair, should have an equal probability of rolling any of those three values. And the outcome is going to be random. So each student has the same random chance of being selected because you uh, rolled a three doesn't mean that your neighbor is now less likely to roll a three. Mm -hmm. So that's why they are independent of one another. And so we can say, yes, that protocol is simple random sampling. They don't affect each other. They're independent. And the outcome is random. So here's the next. This is more practice with determining what the population is, what the sampling frame is, and what the sample is. So in this case, the population, I would say, if we're talking about the students in this class that take public transportation to school, yep. I would say that we have a small population, and it would be the students that are in this, in this class. class. And we could perform a census. Yeah, we could. With such a small number. But in this case, you know, we're just there on that day. We're curious. We want to know. So we're going to do something that's easy, and we're going to choose a sampling frame and a mm -hmm. sample. So the population is just our data management class because those are the people that we're interested in. Mm -hmm. The sampling frame, what do you think, Mr. Jackson? Those would be the people that, of course, showed up today. Because if you're not in class today, you're not going to be able to roll be a dice. part of this experiment. You're yeah. not going to be able to roll the dice. So our sampling frame is, yeah, okay, we're interested in this class. We're only going to be able to talk to the people that showed up today. And so the sample then is anyone that rolled the two, the three, or the five. Yep. Right? So the group of students who rolled one of the chosen numbers. And those people will be polled to see whether or not yes. they actually took public transportation exactly. to get to school. So now this next little part, what we're going to do here is now that we've kind of determined this little experiment, we're actually going to do it. Yeah, when you come into class yeah, next day, when you come day, into class next we're going to hand you a die. And we're going to actually do this, and we're going to see, okay, how closely does this simple random sample estimate the population, the of, our population of our class? Yeah. Now, a couple of different things could happen. We could get very good agreement. We could also get very bad agreement. Because what happens if, out of the 30 people that are in our class, 15 roll the dice, and the 15 that roll the dice just happen to be the 15 people that don't take public transportation? Yeah. Is that going to be representative? No, it won't be. But we're actually going to do it and we're going to see it. The thing with simple random sampling is that because it's very straightforward, because it's completely random, your sample could go a couple of different ways. And so it's one to be careful of. In addition to um, this, there's a couple things that we want you to look at tonight. So the survey, or excuse me, the, the, the chart that we put together here for simple, simple random, random sampling. sampling. Yeah. <clears throat> we would like you to continue this chart, and we would like you to look at systematic, systematic sampling, stratified sampling, cluster sampling, 
convenient sampling, and then multi-stage and voluntary response. And these are found on pages 114 to 116 in your textbook. We encourage you to make a chart that looks like this, where you have the technique in the first column, the description, and then give an example. The textbook also has, in the, the pages preceding 114 to 116, a few examples that they use. And so when you come to class tomorrow, when you come to next class, uh, have this, this chart with you. And then as a group, we'll have a discussion, we'll perform an activity, we'll actually do some of these different sampling yeah. types yeah. on a, a population, and then talk about which ones worked and why some worked better than others. Yeah. Okay. So that's your lesson for today. Good luck.